Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, the ABCs of Treating Data as Products, sponsored today by Data.World. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. And to find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Tim Gasper. Tim is the VP of Product at Data.World and co-host of the web show and podcast Catalog and Cocktails. He pre Previously served as Director of Product at Jan Rain, Head of Product at Marketing at Bitfusion, and VP of Product and Global Offerings Manager at InfoChimps. Tim has over 13 years of product management and product marketing experience and is a writer and speaker on entrepreneurship, lean startup methodology, analytics, and AI. And with that, I will give the floor to Tim to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. And hey, everybody from all over. I see folks chiming into the chat with their locations. This is so cool. Always love working with you, Shannon, and Dataversity uh, and getting to look at all this awesome content and meet all these great people. Um, and today we have a really exciting topic, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm very um, happy to present to you all. And uh, it is inspired a lot by a lot of the trends and excitement around data mesh but specifically zooming into one very important aspect of it, I think my favorite aspect of it, which is data products. Uh, and folks like yourselves and really all across the data space are trying to understand what's up with data products. Like how do I, uh, how do I benefit from product data product thinking, literal data product creation? Um, you know, what is the process by which we go about it? When should I do it and when should I not? So we're going to hit all sorts of interesting topics today related to the data product concept and specifically a framework that um, that myself and actually my other host at Catalog and Cocktails, Juan Cicada, Dr. Juan Cicada came up with, which is um, the ABCs, the data product ABCs, which is a framework to think about how to manage and build those data products. So looking forward to going through that all with you today. Uh, and without further ado, I'll go ahead and, and jump in. So first of all, um, who am I to talk? Appreciate the introduction, Shannon. So yes, I've, I've been uh, at a lot of different companies, always in the data AI and, uh, and analytics spaces. Um, also do a lot of speaking and writing on data. And you can find me uh, on Twitter, Tim Gasper, LinkedIn uh, at uh, in slash Tim Gasper, and uh, also uh, timgasper.com. Uh, and I am the co-host of a um, really awesome uh, show called Catalog and Cocktails. We do it live every Wednesday, and we also push out to all of the most popular social platforms and podcast platforms. Um, really excited to be in the top 2.5% of global podcast listenership, which is a very oddly specific statistic, uh, but we're really proud of it. Um, and, you know, we would love to have any of you join us and, and please like and subscribe. Uh, we talk about um, anything related to data management and analytics, and the whole focus Focus is honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation. So we're not pushing, uh, you know, specific technologies. We're just asking hard questions about, you know, governance, about data ops, around knowledge, around analytics, around AI, and much, much more. So check it out. We're at over 100 episodes now. I think we just did episode 105 last week. So pretty awesome. And speaking of awesome shows, also you should check out all the great content coming out of Dataversity. Um, there's actually an awesome podcast that uh, Shannon has been putting together around careers and data. Juan and I were super lucky to uh, to be honored to be one of the, the sets of guests that came onto that show. So definitely check out some of those links on the left-hand side if you're curious to check out about that. And not just us, but all the other great guests that are that are on that podcast. So thank you, Shannon, for putting together some really great, great content there and, and give people a view into not just different careers that you can do in data, but also um, you know just learning interesting things about data through all those great chats. So who is data.world and, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, why are we kind of talking to you all today? Um, and data.world is the enterprise data catalog for the modern data stack. And we're powered by a knowledge graph. What that means is that we uh, were born in the cloud 
And everything that you put into data.world's catalog and governance platform lives in a connected knowledge graph. And so whether you care a lot about that and you're like, oh my gosh, like I wanna take advantage of awesome semantics, the same technology that the uh, World Wide Web is built on, awesome. For those of you who are just like, you know what, that's the car and the Ferrari, and I just like to drive the Ferrari, and I just want to press the gas pedal and hear the engine go vroom, that's cool too. Um, and ultimately, what matters is that driving experience, which is uh, really what we think of as adoption. So we're really focused on making sure that people can find, understand, trust, and access data at scale. We have over 1.8 million users using our catalog. Um, really focused on fast iterations. We do over a thousand releases a year and we're not just a metadata catalog. Uh, we're also able to provide federated data access through our platform as well. So thank you to all of our customers that you can see on the right hand side there and many, many more. These are just the ones that let us use our logos um, and really appreciate all the kudos that we get from them. Um, also, a quick shout out to Snowflake. We are a very deep technology partner with Snowflake. We are both we are a Snowflake ready technology partner, Premier, as well as powered by uh, Snowflake. So, um, very close partners with them, as well as a variety of other players in the space. We think it's important for a catalog to work with many different technologies, but especially work very deeply uh, with your your data warehouse. So, let's jump into the content here. So, really, this whole idea of data products has uh it's been around for a while now but has really taken up steam when the data mesh movement has come a buzz uh and data mesh really became popular let's say about a year and a half ago is when it really started to emerge onto the scene and now it's just like blaring excitement slash hype um and for those of you that aren't as familiar with data mesh it's really all about uh how do we really scale um, uh, our, our data investments and, and, and not just from a technology perspective, but especially from a social perspective, it's a socio-technical paradigm. Um, and the problem is, is that there's monolithic data infrastructures. And the problem isn't necessarily that we can't scale the technology. It's that actually these systems don't scale socially across a larger enterprise. And in general, we're treating data too much like an afterthought, right? When people say things like, oh, data exhaust or, you know, even things like data is the new oil, which sounds like it's something that is, you know, pulled from the ground and consumed, uh, that that is sort of the previous paradigm of thinking. And really going forward, we want to try to tap into that untapped value of data, turn it into a reusable and sustainable asset uh, and actually overcome the barriers that overly centralized platforms and processes can cause for us to be able to be effective around data, right? And the quintessential example of sort of data management gone wrong is you've got this centralized governance team, you've got this centralized data engineering team, all things go into that group, all things come out of that group. And ultimately what happens is you're waiting for a very long time, right? Those data breadlines. Um, as well as you are trying to um, uh, trying to go around them, right? And so you get sort of shadow data IT sprouting out all over. What? That division bought Snowflake? Oh, but we already consolidated around Databricks, right? You get all sorts of problems like that. And, and it's out of this sort of morass around trying to scale data, both socially and technically, that data mesh really became um, exciting. And um, it's a little bit borderline religion now, uh, and that gives me kind of a chuckle, uh, but I'm, I'm just glad we're having the conversation because I think when you look at the big data movement, when you look at the AI movement, a lot of these previous movements uh, of, of sort of hype and excitement have been very technology centric. And I'm very excited that we're finally getting very hyped and excited about something that is not just about technology, but also about the social challenges around data that we need to solve in our organizations. And so, you know, kudos to all of us for getting excited about something that's uh, the people in process, not just the technology. So just double clicking a little bit more on data mesh, um, there are really four main components or tenets of what data mesh is to try to solve that problem of monolithic, uh, both technology and social structure in our enterprise. And it comes down to these four things. So it's first of all, domain ownership. So empowering the folks across the business, wherever they may be, to be able to create and steward the data, because they are the experts, they are the ones who are closest to it, and therefore the best to manage it. So it's really about sort of democratizing and federating the management of data to the different domains in your organization. And 
depending on what industry you're in and depending on how you think about your business, domains might be your business units. It might be your functional areas. It might be your products. You know, there's a lot of different ways to think about domains and that's a webinar all its own. Um, but, um, you know, domains essentially is, you know, how you, how you think about your business and organize your business based on areas of expertise and management. Um, so the first tenet of data mesh is around domain ownership. The second tenet is around data as a product. So that is really about managing data with end users and the end stakeholders in mind, really thinking about the user experience of data and the surface area of data. Um, the third piece around data mesh is self-serve data infrastructure as a platform. That's the piece of this whole cycle that's probably the most technology centric. And that really means that if you're going to spread responsibility to all the different parts of the organization around the data, aka the domain ownership, and if you're going to ask them to treat and manage and do the life cycle around data more like a product, then you better provide them the tools and the self-service infrastructure to be able to do that. Uh, and that's what's becoming the sort of modern platforms that, you know, if, you, if you're in an organization that has a data platform team or an IT organization focused around data, then usually this is their mandate, right? To sort of choose these different tools and, and be able to provide them to the broader organization so that when they're building out pipelines or trying to solve certain analytical or AI use cases that they've got the right tools for the job. So things that often sit in this category are things like a catalog or a governance solution, you know, your data integration solutions or ETL or collection integration solutions, data storage and compute, your Snowflakes, your Databricks, your Azure Synapse, your Google BigQuery, all that type of thing, right? Uh, transformation and modeling tools. If you're uh, leveraging things like DBT in terms of a more modern uh, SQL oriented uh, modeling environment for your data warehouse, then you know things like DBT might fit in that layer. Or maybe you're using more of an ETL platform for that type of work. Um, BI and analytics, AI tools, and then um, you know things like data observability, data quality. These are all things that kind of fit into this self-serve data infrastructure as a platform bucket where as you're building out those data products, some um, combination of these things are gonna help you. And then finally, the fourth piece of data mesh, perhaps the uh, least well understood, and so therefore one that you know companies like us at data.world have been leaning into to try to um, create more clarity around, is around federated computational governance. And so if you're doing the domain ownership, the data is a product and a self-serve platform, then you need to figure out how to scale the governance aspect of this, right? Which is the safety, the interoperability, and then the enablement uh, around all of this data. And um, you have to find the right balance between centralization and decentralization to make that work. So certain things, policies, principles, interoperability standards, those should probably be centrally managed. And so if you have a steward council or a governance council or you know a chief compliance and officer in partnership with a, a head of governance, you know these are the types of folks that might provide some of that centralized uh, organization around that. But then for everything else, you really try to empower those different domains to manage governance locally in those different domains in a way that makes sense to them. Um, and so that's where the federated aspect comes from, right? You try not to have all governance be centrally managed. You try to create the core language, the core rules of the road, things like interoperability standards, and then really the rest, like, uh, for example, uh, you know, creating data testing rules or something like that, right? Those should really be democratized to the domains instead of trying to have one central office create all the, you know, the data tests for the entire organization. That's just kind of one example there. Now, one last thing on federated computational governance. Why does the word computational show up there? Well, that's essentially a nod towards this should really be technology enabled if possible. Uh, and so, you know, if you're using an identity management platform, if you're using, uh, you know, an access management platform, um, you know, if you're using things like AWS IAM, right, these are all examples of ways to programmatically and through policy be able to manage uh, sort of the rules around access and around visibility and around capability. And uh, they, uh, because they're policy driven and because they're code driven, um, they can be computed against. So basically, the whole point of that word is that as much as possible, governance should be automated, not manual. So these four things come together to really enable data mesh. And today, the piece that we're really especially gonna zoom into is data as a product. 
which is really that idea of keeping those end users and end stakeholders in mind and treating your data with some of the best practices of product management so you can get the, the maximum benefit and value out of your data. So we're actually gonna start with the takeaway first, right? And hopefully what you kind of take away from this whole talk is that consuming data to solve the critical business problems should be as easy as buying a product on your favorite e-commerce platform. So think about uh, Amazon, for example, and you know, let's say you're searching for a water bottle. You know, there's a lot of options out there um, and you need to be able to figure out which one's the best one. And in order to determine a good product, you look at a lot of factors, right? You look at like, oh, the reviews, the price, the images, the documentation around it. When you click those different things, you're going to get to see all the information about that product. You also see like the importance of search and discovery around being able to find these products. Um, and then on top of all of that, there's a lot of duplication here, right? There's a lot of different... Um, a lot of different water bottles available on a place like uh, Amazon. Over 10,000 results, if you see at the top left there. Um, and that starts to go also into life cycle, which is that um, this is a, a marketplace and may the best product win. Uh, and the ones that don't win should probably go away. They should fade away and we shouldn't be maintaining them anymore, right? Those vendors should not exist. So that's a bit of an analogy, right? To think about uh, both how data product management maybe can be a different framework to think about how you work with data in your organization, but also more specifically the end user experience. The end user experience of a data product should be like a data shopping experience or an analytics shopping experience. So let's kind of keep that in mind as we go through all of this. So what are the data product ABCs. So we've been working with a lot of customers over at data.world and specifically also Juan and I have talked to over a hundred guests now on catalog and cocktails, some vendors, but also a lot at various companies like WPP, um, like uh, Rapid6, like many others that are building out uh, varying scales of data platforms, data capabilities, um, and then being able to actually um, bring those capabilities to market. And we have found some trends, some trends around where data products succeed and where they hit stumbling uh, blocks and start to fail. And um, as we started to write these things down, words like accountability and expectations and knowledge and downstream all started to show up. And we started to see a little bit of a pattern here. So we just leaned in, we fully embraced it. Uh, and it was the data product ABCs and it became A, B, C, D, E. Um, and if you're curious about that QR code there, that'll take you to a little bit of collateral on uh, a little bit more detail around the data product ABCs. We have a, uh, I think it's like a, either a white paper or some documentation around that. So feel free to check that out. Uh, but basically the data product ABCs are accountability, boundaries, contracts and expectations, downstream consumers, and explicit knowledge. And we really see this as a, a really valuable framework for how to think about and build out effective data products. Um, and uh, the caveat that Juan and I always say when we go through data product ABCs is this is an agile framework. And so please, uh, you know, poke holes in it, ask questions, um, contribute ideas to it, because our goal is not to let this framework be fixed in time. We want it to evolve. Um, so let us know what your thoughts are and questions, and, uh, and we want to incorporate them in. And actually, several folks have provided some ideas that we've incorporated already. You won't know that because you'll just see the latest framework, but a lot of these actually were because of the collaboration with the broader data and governance community. So let's start off with the first one. The first one is accountability. And this is really important because accountability is really about who. It's about the people. And behind all data, all analytics, and all the projects in your organization, all the org structure, at the, at the end of it all, or at the beginning of it all, there's people. People who made those decisions, people who had those ideas, people that get called when things break and go wrong. Uh, right. And so those people are at the center of everything that's going on from a data perspective, and it needs to be captured and understood. And a data product can't exist if it doesn't have some 
sense of accountability, right? So you think back to that analogy of the on Amazon, right? Every one of those products has a vendor behind it. And those vendors have people working at them. There's accountability that has to be built in here, right? When you order one of those products, a person is going to fulfill that or a machine is going to fulfill that in the warehouse. And then it's going to get loaded onto a truck and a person's going to drive that over to your house, right? So there are people involved in the entire process. The same is true with data. So some of the key questions that you should be asking when you think about accountability are who is the owner or, right, if you don't like the word owner, um, there's a lot of great other terms out there like trustee, like um, ambassador is actually one that Laura Madsen um, uh, pushes. Uh, she's the one, person who wrote uh, Disrupting Data Governance. Great book, by the way, if you're, if you're interested. Um, who is the owner, trustee, or ambassador that is responsible for the data? Like who does the buck stop with? But that's usually not enough. Usually there's more than one who. Um, and if you just stop with owner, you may not be going far enough. You should ask some other questions that have a who attached to them. Who defines the requirements? So for this data product, let's pick like order data, for example, people are ordering things. Um, who decides that we should add new columns to that table? Who decides that new use cases should be handled for that? Who's that person? Is it the same as the owner or is it actually somebody else? Is the owner really more the documentarian and actually there's some other person who's actually evolving that, that table or evolving multiple tables or evolving that API, right? Whatever that data product might be. That data product could be you know, an API. It could be a streaming queue. It could be a bus. It could be a lot of different things, right? Or a data set in a, in a data warehouse. Who fixes the product when it breaks, right? Who's the person who... Um, it goes to who's on call is the person who's on call different than the person who fixes it when it breaks right do you have an internal help desk where you know folks are, are kind of handling it first before the data engineer gets assigned and then who's in trouble if the data is mishandled what is the li the liability scheme or the compliance scheme who's that person and there's probably a number of other questions that you can be asking inside your organization around accountability. And one uh, recommendation that I would have is consider what are the least number of people that you could list while still being complete, um, right? And so it's probably around four or five people that are in play here. There's usually a more of a technical person, probably the person who's fixing it when it breaks, um, there's a more business oriented person who's maybe the SME or defining the requirements. Um, there's usually a person from a liability standpoint, and then there's usually even a fourth person involved in this, right? Maybe a top user, a person that you ask on how to use the data. And so it's important to capture that. That's the accountability structure, and that's important to the data product. When you think about other types of roles in your organization that may be uh, related to this, here's just uh, some examples of, of different roles, different accountability folks that might be in play here. From a strategic perspective, there might be certain executive owners, right? An executive steward or an executive champion, a program manager, a technical architect or a project manager who's, who's involved in, in having some accountability around this data. There may be certain consumers that have accountability over the use cases or the analysis of the data. Um, there might be some folks that are more on the producer side, whether that be more of a data steward or a data engineer or a data product manager, right? So this just gives you some ideas of some of the roles. And again, going back to that razor, right? What are the minimum number of folks that you could list that are accountable to a product um, that you could identify? Uh, what's the, the, the smallest number there, but still complete and compelling and useful? The second piece to this framework is boundaries. And uh, just to really emphasize the point here, I put all my bullets in a box and I also put a cat in a box. So hope you enjoy. Um, and some questions here are, what is the data? Like, seriously, where is it? What is it? What are the columns? What is the, you know, like, where is it? Um, where will it live? Is it in Snowflake? Is it in S3? Is it in Databricks? Is it in, where is it? Uh, what isn't it, right? And, and this is where we get a little bit into abstractions to some degree, but it's important because a product has a surface area. A product has features and capabilities and it has some things it doesn't do. And it's important to be clear. 
So for example, if a data product is an API, but it's a SOAP API, not a REST API, then you got to be clear on that. You have to be detailed on what it is and what it isn't. Um, if that data uh, includes these seven columns, but uh, excludes these other three columns, right? That, that's, that's what it is and what it isn't. And not just what's in the box, but also what are the inputs and outputs? So what are the interfaces? Is it accessed through JDBC? Is it accessed through an API? Do you consume it from a streaming perspective, right? These are the inputs and outputs. Are you, you know, are you able to download it? These are all important aspects of the boundaries of that product. And finally, how do you balance the roadmap against some of the other organizational priorities and considerations? These are all sort of aspects around how to think about the boundaries and the present, the present day, the now of a given data product. So this is, think of it as building that box and then what are the holes or the interfaces that that box has? Or if you want another analogy, think of it as like the castle, right? The castle has a wall around it so that it, it's clear what it is, where it is, but then it has it has a, a drawbridge that goes across that moat. Maybe it has a few drawbridges, right? What, what are the walls? What are inside that castle and what are the drawbridges that go across that moat? This, this is all about the boundaries of that data product. It's what gives it its definition. The third piece is contracts and expectations. And I'll go through the questions and at the end, I'll kind of comment about the difference between a contract and an expectation. So examples of things that fall into the category of contracts and expectations are, what are the data constraints, definitions, and tests around the data, right? Is a phone number supposed to look a certain way for it to be considered a phone number? Otherwise, you know, it's outside the boundaries of that. Um, is there a certain test that's so supposed to work? There's a test that is checking if, if there's uh, null values and if that, uh, and it should, this column should never be null. It should have never have any nulls in it. It should always be 100% complete. These are examples of contracts and expectations. What are the service level availability and the service level objective? So is it supposed to be up 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time? If it goes down, how fast can we expect it to be come back online? What are the sharing agreements or consented uses and policies around it? So am I um, only able to use this in a certain context because we have a contract with a certain other entity that we actually got this data from? And I need to make sure that I'm following, um, uh, following that agreement. Um, is it only be allowed to be used for operational analytical purposes and not for marketing targeting purposes? And that starts to get into consented purpose, which is a sort of connected piece of consented uses. And so, you know, there's a lot of privacy legislation out there now. And although right now, I think Gartner says that even though about 25% of the world's population is covered by modern privacy laws today, by the end of 2024, it's actually going to be at 75% of the world's population. So, um, you know, these modern privacy laws are expanding very rapidly. Uh, in the U.S. alone, right, we've got a lot of conversations about, okay, well, now there's CCPA, um, you know, New York City just passed some legislation um, applying to its area of jurisdiction, um, you know, uh, you've got Canada with its own laws, like it's becoming uh, pretty clear now that we need to follow these, even if you're geographically constrained in terms of what you're doing, um, and uh, do we have the right purposes? And, you know, the data product can only be used uh, for those use cases which comply with those consented purposes, um, you know, which can get quite granular. It could go down to the row level in terms of how those consented purposes apply. What is the performance and scale of the product in terms of the, the contracts and expectations there? Uh, if it's an API, should I expect that 99.9% .9 of the time that that API will respond within 500 milliseconds um, or no? Um, and at what scale am I allowed to do things, right? Am I allowed to hit that API 10,000 times a minute or only 100 times a minute? What are the quality and maintainability details? So what else about the data quality and how it's being maintained, uh, what efforts are being done around it can help me to understand whether to trust this data. 
Um, and what are the security constraints around it, right? Does it have to be encrypted? Um, are certain columns hashed? These are all things that might be true about that data. And what's different between a contract and expectation? Well, an expectation is not a firm commitment, right? An expectation is, in most cases, you should expect it to work this way. And so an example might be, so we said, um, hey, 99% uh, SLA, maybe that's an expectation. You know, We're aiming for it to be available 99% of the time. Uh, that would be an expectation. A contract would be if we uh, if we break that, we're in breach. And so a contract is a stronger expectation, a stronger commitment than an expectation is. And for those of you that are keeping track of what's sort of buzzalicious in the data community right now, there's a lot of talk around data contracts. Um, and they go pretty, uh, most of those um, uh, conversations go pretty far in terms of the strictness of that data contract. Like they're almost like, programmatically enforcing data contracts. That's kind of an extreme. Um, I think that it's better to think about contracts and expectations in a broader way, because then that allows you to really think about, um, you know, the right balance. You don't want to have too many contracts on your people who are trying to create and manage these data products, because think of them like handcuffs, right? If you put too many handcuffs on somebody, you're going to really slow them down or think of it like molasses, right? You're going to slow them down. Um, there's an agile balance here where as much as possible, you want to establish contracts where um, you really need something to be true. Like if you're building applications that are customer facing and things, you really need some strong contracts, but as much as possible, you'd rather them just be expectations. All right, next, downstream consumers. Who are the current consumers of this data product? Who's the user? Who's the customer? You know, this is D because, you know, we're going in alphabetical order here, but really this is the most important part of a data product. Who is the customer? Who uses the product? And not just who uses it currently, but who could use it? And connected to that is what are the use cases that have been considered around this particular data product? Because that incorporates both the current consumers as well as potential consumers. What is the value of this product? Um, you know, and that can go even so far as monetization, right? Does it have a monetary value to it? If not a monetary value, then just what are the benefits of it and how could it benefit and help those consumers in those different use cases? What is the roadmap of the data product? How is it going to evolve over time? Are you going to be adding new columns in the future? Um, is there a new use case going to be supported? Are you going to add consents to it in the future? Are you going to add um, uh, hashing to one of the column values so that way it can be more widely available to the organization? Instead, right now it's got PII in it, and so you need to ask for permission first. How will it evolve to provide more value to consumers over time? That's related to roadmap. And what's the user experience of the data? And so this connects to some previous points as well. So down, downstream consumers, a data product that has no consumer isn't a very good data product and probably shouldn't exist. Finally, explicit knowledge. This is really where you take everything that we just talked about and wrap it all together. And this is especially oriented around documentation. The more you can create automatic documentation, great, but manual documentation is important too. And this is where you focus on what is the meaning of this data product and the different ingredients or components that make up that product. If it is data oriented, what is the schema? If it's graph oriented, what is the ontology? Or if it's conceptual oriented? How is it related to other data products, right? So conceptually related, are there duplicates? Is this actually a duplicate of another data set and it's been just moved from one place to another? The conceptually related synonyms, antonyms, uh, even more specific technology relationships, like can this table be joined with another? That's an important relationship that should be explicit, not implicit. And then, you know, where's the documentation? Tell me about how to use this data. And this is where not all products are created equal. And if you in your organization have five products, 10 products, maybe you can manage them all with a high level of fidelity and investment. But if you have 100 data products, 200, 300 data products, that might be a pretty large surface area. And so consider what are the most important data products to really invest in more detail across these four different, these five different letters this, for this framework versus ones that are a little less critical. And think about life cycle. 
what data products can we actually retire? Because going back to that marketplace example, right? Thinking about that Amazon marketplace, what um, products uh, are successful are going to continue to be successful. Those that are not successful should go away. They should disappear. They should retire, right? So there's a little bit of a capitalistic aspect here too to data products. So let's bring this all together. Here's an example. It's a little wordy, but I want to show it to you all in one go so you can kind of see what this all looks like. So let's say you create a data product around user data. And the accountability may be that the product domain is responsible. Um, the technical steward is, um, uh, if something goes wrong with the data pipeline, is Alice. The business steward is there if there's any questions about the meaning of the data, and that's Bob. And the data product manager, who's a, a member of that product domain, uh, who's gathering the requirements and managing the roadmap, is Charlene. So th there's our accountability structure. Boundaries. This uh, data product is going to contain data about users starting from January 1st, 2022 and onwards. Users are defined as people who have activated their account. This data product is going to live in our cloud data warehouse. So these are some examples of some boundary aspects. Contracts and expectations. This data product will have a list of all the users. It will contain the unique internal ID, date created, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the data should be complete. In other words, there's no reason for missing data. This is the definitive number of users. This data product is near real time with up to one hour lag. You can see how some of these are articulated here. Like this is not a contract, it's more of an expectation. This can only be used for internal company purposes. If any of this data, including aggregated, needs to be shared outside the company, the data product manager needs to be consulted. So we're giving people some expectations around usage. And then data is available in the Cloud Data Warehouse where it can be accessed through SQL or through the BI tool. Who's going to use this data, right? Who are the consumers? These are the consumers of the data product. The customer success team is the main consumer of the data. Marketing and sales teams could use this data for upsell and cross-sell. So the implication there is that maybe that's a potential user. Maybe they're not using it today. Marketing team wants to use this for personalized offers, but that's not a target use case yet. So that's another future opportunity. Depending on the requirements, more attributes can be added. The customer success team wants to use the data through a BI tool. So this is showing you how the downstream consumers interact with this. Then finally, explicit knowledge. A user is any person who signed up for our system starting on January 1st that has activated their account. The schema is, and then imagine a schema definition here, a data dictionary. The user can be associated with exactly one email. So we're talking about some more explicit uh, knowledge about this data. And then finally, a user data product can be joined with user activity data product. That's an example of some relationships and relations that are, uh, instead of being implicit, now are explicit. So again, this is just a selection. This is just an example, but this gives you an idea. Think about your own organization. Think about your own data assets that you're building. Think about your analytic assets that you're building. And, and consider how a product-oriented approach using these ABCs could actually help you to have higher quality products, have more valuable products, have more discoverable and understandable products, and also maybe help you manage the surface area and the life cycle, help you see which products should live and evolve and be invested in, which new products should be created, and then maybe which product should go away? Should we, should we retire sort of product life cycle? So this next section really is how do we build data products? So hopefully in that previous section there, you're really saying, okay, this framework could be really helpful in thinking about how to manage those data products, how to create a quality framework around them and how to document them. But how do we actually go about building them? And we actually think this is where governance actually plays a really important role. Um, and at data.world, we really push this concept of agile data governance, where you're really iterating around governance, uh, around your data, around your data products, your analytics, um, combining both safety as well as value and knowledge. Uh, and it's really focused around adapting the best practices of agile and open software to data and analytics. And so what that means is you've got, first of all, the team, right? The people that are going to help to build those data products. Um, if you're a more forward thinking organization, or maybe actually data products are part of your revenue stream, then perhaps you have data product managers. And, and actually at data.world and, and also at Catalog and Cocktails, we're seeing a pretty big rise in data product managers, not just in companies that actually sell data or have you know externally facing data products, but actually internal 
data product managers as well that can work with data architects, data engineers, and analysts to actually create um, uh, a more product-centric approach to data pipelines and those data products that are getting created internally as well. But it could be folks that are more traditional, like data architects, SAs, DBAs, uh, data engineers, data ops folks, and, and many others. So these are your data producers. And then you've got your data consumers. It might be your analysts, your data scientists, machine learning engineers, BI teams, business professionals. And both of these groups, producers and consumers, need to work together in order to develop these data products. In the same way, think of it as like a software product manager. A software product manager, if they're doing a good job, doesn't just come up with a data product um, in the ether uh, and then just say like, I think it would be awesome if this product existed. And then, you know, imagine that data, that product manager doesn't talk to any consumers. They don't do any testing. They just go get some engineers and they go build a product and then they build it and hope people will come. And, you know, sometimes you hear of amazing successes when that happens, but most of the time you do not because that's not grounded in what the consumers want. They are not influencing it. There's no feedback loop. It's not lean. It's not iterative. Uh, and that's why we think producers and consumers working together is so important. Um, and uh, these roles cannot be fixed by individual. Sometimes a producer may actually be a, a consumer in another context uh, and vice versa. Next, it's important is really focusing on the use case. And that requires you to understand what is the consumer trying to do Let's develop a backlog of the business questions that we're trying to answer around our data. If we have existing data that's being used to solve this, then maybe it's about identifying, hey, which of the data is already being used to solve this use case and, and kind of have that be a part of this here. And ultimately the end user business value is the driver. Consider cataloging your questions and backlog and, and actually cataloging the people uh, in your data catalog, think a little more exp expansively about the role that a data catalog could potentially help you um, in, in developing this backlog around business questions. Next, you got to curate data assets. Sometimes that means creating new data assets. Oftentimes it means identifying the assets already within your organization that are being leveraged to answer this question and just formalizing it, building that boundary around it and identifying you know, these five uh, data product ABCs um, uh, around that. Uh, and here it's important to, to collaborate, release early, do peer reviews, really define and document what that product is, contextualize, link to policy, clarify, clarify and refine. This is really applying the data product ABCs uh, and capture the knowledge as the work is done, right? So if possible, if especially when you're creating new data products, new data assets, ask the data engineers and the folks producing the data to document it as they go. So it doesn't have to be a post hoc sort of end activity that a data steward or a business analyst is attempting to do all the way at the end. The folks producing the data and working with the consumers are gonna be in the best position to really capture a lot of that explicit knowledge. Next, enable. This is a missing piece often, and it's all actually an exciting topic to think about is we talk so much about you know, data ops, we talk now about data as a product, so it's great that that's becoming more popular, but a concept that isn't being really talked about is one around data marketing. And actually, uh, Emily Pick over at data.world, uh, she is a, a senior product marketer on our team. Uh, she's been evangelizing a, a lot around this topic around data marketing. Um, and the whole idea around data marketing is when you think about a product, and let's go back to that Amazon analogy, and you stick that water bottle into the marketplace, just because you stick it there doesn't all of a sudden mean that you're going to get a lot of uh, people uh, going to see it. Even if you document it well, even if it has some good reviews and things like that, right? that'll increase the chances that it'll create value, but it still may not get value. What happens on the other end is people are doing SEO marketing, they're doing SEM, they're doing uh, you know, content marketing. There's all this marketing activity that's happening and enablement activity that's happening to actually make it so that people buy that water bottle in many cases, right? So think within your own organization, when you have a data product and you want people to use it and you're confident that it's good, a product manager does more than just make the data product. They actually help to evangelize it. So training, evangelize, uh, evangelism, community, accessibility, being hands-on. This is all important aspects of enabling consumers to actually be able to use this um, and know about it and apply it to the right use cases. 
then you really are entering the phase of, okay, well, consumers are going to find and understand and trust it. They're going to use it to do their analysis. They're going to answer business questions. This is what we call the development of working insights. And on the producer side, this is really about learning and iterating. So you want to measure how are people using the data product, kind of audit it, uh, provide advice and assistance, improve the documentation, improve the product. Um, fast, safe enablement of end users is the goal. And based on you know, that measurement and that advice, it all feeds back. And so either we're improving our data products, we're creating new data products, or we're retiring data products that shouldn't exist anymore. Maybe in some cases, we're even like merging or splitting data products into different pieces. Uh, really, this is all part of a portfolio and an iterative process to solve the most value for your organization, given the, given the resources and the priorities that you have. So we think that this is a really powerful process to think about developing these data products. And, and even if you're a little skeptical about the idea of data products and you're just thinking about data governance in a more sort of general and generic way, this process can be helpful as well to think about how do I achieve governance outcomes in uh, days or weeks, not months and years. And we really think that the time impact of being fast, incremental, and iterative is super important. Because the traditional approach to governance or the traditional approach to developing data products is really more of a waterfall approach where it could take many months or years to really get to that first step of value. And we think that the data product approach and the agile data governance approach really allows you to focus on, hey, let's do data product number one, data product number two, data product number three, and number four, and iterate our way towards value for the organization. And we're gonna be much more agile, we're gonna be much more effective, and we're going to create way more value for the organization. And when we get to outcomes like, for example, one of our customers at Data.World is a company, OneWeb. Um, if you're familiar with uh, SpaceX and their Starlink uh, system, which is a constellation of satellites to provide satellite internet, uh, OneWeb also is creating a, um, a satellite internet service. Um, and uh, OneWeb actually, uh, by building data products uh, through Data.World, through Snowflake, and the rest of their stack, actually was able to uh, monetize the data on their environment. And they actually paid for their entire data stack. Um, at the end of the 12 month period, they paid for their entire data stack um, by monetizing their data. Two tables that they had and they monetized it um, and it paid for their entire data stack. So that's obviously you know more of a data monetization example, but that just shows you the power of this data product approach to, to not just have conceptual value, but actually to turn into real dollar value. What are the metrics? Consider some of these questions, like how many of your employees are searching for the data on a regular basis? How many of your employees are doing self-service analysis with the data? How many data apps are being built to change the way that the business runs? What are the adoption rates in various tools, right? Are people you know, finding it in the catalog? Are they using it with BI tools? Are they using uh, you know, your data science tools and, and notebooks on it? What are the most common types of data that employees are using to deliver business impact? And do you have a data community internally or externally and how many people are active within it? These are all you know, different examples of metrics that can help you understand the impact of your data product, how much people are using it, how valuable it is, and what is the actual addressable market within your company. One thing that product managers think a lot about is total addressable market, TAM, TAM, right? And so what is the TAM within your organization of this particular asset? Is it very valuable to a couple of people? Is it kind of valuable, but to a lot of people? Is it hugely valuable to a lot of people, right? There's almost a quadrant here of sort of, you know, the size of the audience and the amount of value. And that will really help you get more of an ROI model, almost an accounting around your data products. You can almost think of it like, hey, I have to have a financial model around my data here. And the point of that is not to make our lives harder as data professionals or data leaders, right? Like, should we all start hiring accountants now? There's actually some people that think you should. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going that far. But data accounting is important because we have limited resources. We have limited time. And when somebody comes to you with a frivolous request for a new governance process or a new policy or a new data product where you're like, I don't think we should work on that. This gives us a framework to say like, look, the data doesn't support that this is going to be useful. It's data about the people doing data, right? We're getting pretty meta here, which is exciting, but this is, uh, this is how metrics can really help us get more aligned 
And I think wearing this product manager hat is going to really empower all of you, whether it's a, a formal hat or just an informal hat. It's a really good framework to think about things. So let's start to bring this all together. So takeaways. Consuming data to solve the crucial business problems should be as easy as buying a product on your favorite e-commerce platform. Hopefully today you've seen through these examples and through this framework how you can achieve more of this sort of e-commerce uh, type of approach through a, a pretty simple framework of, of recognizing and identifying things as well as documenting them, right? Focus on accountability, boundaries, contracts and expectations, downstream consumers, and explicit knowledge. And not necessarily in that order, right? As you heard me mention, downstream consumers, if you don't have a consumer of a product, it's not really a product. So all of these are really important aspects, the ABCs of data products. And then finally, leverage the best practices of agile software development to create and manage your data products. You can learn from how software product management delivers these software data products in a fast way, in an agile way, in a high quality way, in a responsive way, and apply those same practices to the world of data, both literally in terms of data, developing your data products, as well as the overarching governance and process around that, right? How do I implement just in time governance that moves the bar as much as possible into an empowered model that federates that governance as much as possible to the domains while doing the minimum valuable things in a centralized way to make sure that we're doing things safely and effectively. So to learn more about data mesh governance and around data products and data mesh, uh, we actually have a really great white paper called an actionable framework for governing the data mesh. Um, if you don't want to remember this kind of long URL at the bottom here, just go to data.world and go to resources and you can find it there in our reports and tools area. Uh, it goes into some really great practical examples and some more details around how to apply the data product ABCs, uh, as well as sort of the best practices around agile data governance and data mesh. So definitely check that out. And please come and check out our show, Catalog and Cocktails. We talk about topics like the data products, uh, like governance, like master data management. Uh, just the other day, we had the VP of AI from Samsung, where we talked about the future of AI. So come and check it out. Uh, we'd love to have you. It's an honest, no BS, non salesy conversation. And we drink cocktails during it. So we encourage you to bring your cocktail with you. Tell us what you're drinking in the comments. Thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully this was very interesting to you all and I'll pass it back over to you, Shannon, uh, to see if there's any comments or questions that we should help address. And lots of great questions coming in and just to answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and the recording along with anything else coming in. And I recommend the, the podcast here that you're, you're promoting at Catalog and Cocktails. I still can't believe you guys do it live. It's so brave. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much for the support. It's, it's a ton of fun. <laughs> So diving in here, Tim, do data products include the raw data where the data itself is the product? Um, great question. So is the data product inclusive of sort of the raw like data that's part of it, right? Is that the question? Perfect. Yeah. So the this is where an interesting uh, analogy comes to play. So the answer is, I would say overall, yes, right? So for example, if you have let's say five tables and those five tables together when joined together provide you customers, right? That customer's data product is, is those five tables in combination with the, uh, the A, B, C, D, E that you saw here today in this presentation. So that, that becomes that data product. Um, the one sort of caveat to that is there's this overarching question that I think is a little bit academic, but also very practical at the same time, which is like, what is a data product and what is like not really a data product? And the analogy that I found to be useful there is think of like an assembly line that's building laptops. Uh, and that laptop assembly line might have like circuit boards um, uh, that are part of it. And maybe there's wires that are part of it. And there's a bunch of other you know pieces, uh, the frame of the laptop, all of that comes together to create the laptop. Um, is the circuit board a lap? Is the circuit board a, a a product? Yeah, but the consumer is the factory that builds or the company that builds the laptops, right? So they procure the circuit boards from somebody. So yeah, that circuit board is a is a data. It, it is a product, right? But um, but it has a specific consumer that isn't necessarily the end consumer. 
Is the laptop a product? Yeah, the laptop's definitely a product. Um, is the frame of the laptop a product? Uh, maybe, right? Is like half a circuit board a product? Uh, I don't know, not probably not, because it's not really functional if it's just half the circuit board. So I, I, I know that's a little bit of an academic question, but it, it helps you to kind of think like what is and what isn't a product. So within our data environment, I think an important thing is, is every table a data product? No. I think we should be pretty clear about that to ourselves and across this sort of the space is that like not every table or every dashboard or everything is a data product. It's a data product when it has a clear consumer and has some application of these five A, B, C, D, E things to it. So Tim, are there any metrics on staffing required to achieve the ideals discussed here? Are there any rules of thumb for staffing planning? That, that's a great question, Shannon. And um, the, the rules of thumb here, I think, are, uh, first of all, you can implement more of a data as a product approach with the team that you have today. And think about who's kind of wearing this hat and kind of acknowledge it and give it some kudos and respect and, and maybe a little bit more formality, right? Um, whatever makes sense given your culture and given your resource constraints. And so, like, for example, I have found that there are often certain data architects, certain data engineers, um, just as example, right? That take extra ownership over the data products that they have. And those are like those data engineering leaders and managers that are like often like reaching out to the parts of the business, showing lots of curiosity and empathy to the broader business and really taking ownership over the use and the roadmap of data. Those are people that are already kind of wearing this hat you may find that those are also the individuals that tend to contribute a lot to documentation or are mobilizing the documentation around that data. So those people are kind of wearing that hat and let's kind of give them some respect and a nod for the work that they're doing here, which really could be a role all its own and they're going above and beyond to do that, right? However, I would say that from a resourcing uh, position, we are seeing more companies across our portfolio of companies that we work with, as well as in the industry, starting to invest in data product managers, even for internal use cases. Even if you have only a couple, right, and they're only focused on the highest value, most important data products, that can be a huge boon because now you've got dedicated resourcing focused on how are people going to use this? What is going to be most valuable? What's the roadmap for this? And prioritizing that backlog for the broader data team to work on. So consider how you could be leveraging folks like data product managers more effectively in your own organization if you're not already. And I'm going to see if I can slip in at least one more question, if not two in the last few minutes that we have here. So how do you scope your data products? At what quote unquote level are these products typically defined at? at a subject area for a particular strategy? Uh, good question. Uh, I would say simply scope it at the level of the, uh, you know, use that framework of MVP, which is very important in the software realm, minimum valuable product. Um, what is the minimum valuable product that solves a particular use case or problem, right? And you saw on that one slide, I showed, I showed a business question. So it can be as simple as how many customers did we have last year? And what is the data set that lets them solve that question? that can be your first data product. So I would say start small. Don't try to be too ambitious. Um, it's good to know your broader domain landscape. And so, you know, it, you know, I know a lot of companies invest in creating their domain topology and things like that. That's valuable work. You should do that, right? That helps you create your stewardship system and, and structure and things like that. But when it comes to data products, don't try to like envision all 200 data products that you're going to have. Start with the first one solving the first business question. All right, I think I can slip in one more here. For a shared data product with multiple downstream consumers, what are the effective ways to handle conflicting requirements or different prioritizations being requested on enhancements to the roadmap for the data product? That's a great question. And if there was a one size fits all answer to that, then as v VP of product at data.world, I could just automate my job and just disappear. Um, and I wouldn't even need to exist. <laughs> um, it is a hard, it is a hard problem to optimize for, right? And unfortunately, there's no one size fits all answer. I think that's why I'm so excited about more formally recognizing the role of a data product manager, because that's a messy problem. Multiple stakeholders, multiple use cases. Um, you know, maybe there's a perception of one use case being, you know, a multi-million dollar opportunity, but it's also high risk. So how do you assess that? Well, ultimately, you need to get the right stakeholders in the room. 
You need to talk about it. You need to build out that roadmap and you have to have some sort of trust. Trust that that data product manager, whether formal or just informally recognized is going to make the right call and drive that roadmap forward with continuous improvements to that data product. So I know that's a little bit of a non-answer, but hopefully it gives you a little bit of a framework of, yeah, data, you know, product managers have to deal with this all the time in the software realm and, and the same difficulties yet opportunities ex exist in the data realm. Well, Tim, thank you so much. I'm a, there's so many great questions coming in. I'll get the rest of the questions over to you, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have slated for this webinar. Thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Really appreciate it as always. Tim, thank you so much. Another great, great presentation. Love working with you. And thanks to data.world for making these webinars happen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sharon. And thanks everyone for joining. This has been great. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.